My uh, my name's Andy Andres, and I'm from Boston University. And uh, I was really curious uh, about the new data set released on uh, the Savant site on Pitch Tempo in May. It was May 2022 when they released it. And uh, I was interested in just basic uh, curiosity about how this how the game was going. We all knew the rules last year. AAA was experimenting with the clock pretty seriously. It had been in various leagues before that. There were rumors that it was going to be implemented this year. But the other part of it was I was also, I, I'm the clock operator at Fenway Park. Uh, so I, I was very invested in how this was going to play out. The clock operators, believe it or not, started in 2014. That's a long time ago. And they've been timing various things. Most people never probably noticed the clock in uh, major league ballparks, but uh, I think everyone's noticing it this year. And uh, I don't want to bury the lead for sure. Uh, this is a dramatic impact on the game. And if you paid attention at all, you've seen the positive benefits of adding this pitch clock to the game. It's probably the most dramatic shift in any rule in baseball since uh, they lowered the mound in the late sixties. And so it's going to impact things. A lot of people discussed it. I got very curious last fall when uh, people, it was, it was announced it was going to happen. And I thought, well, who are the pitchers are going to be in trouble? How is this really going to impact the game? So, uh, you know, I started playing around with the data associated with this, uh, with the pitch lead tempo leaderboard to try to understand it better. And I had que different questions. One, I wanted to get, the, it wasn't apparent, the historical sense of, uh, how pitch tempo had changed since the pitch FX era, since the StatCast era. The other question was, are there different teams that actually were using this? Could could you see in the data any teams that might have been different than other teams uh, looking at the data set over uh, the whole, t whole time? And, um, and then I was also curious about those particular players that might be impacted by... Uh, so I'm sorry, the particular players that might be impacted by the new pitch clock rules. And of course, I wanted to just test the little theory that you make sense that most new players, most players arriving into the major leagues with very low service time uh, in 2022 would have no trouble with the new with the new pitch clock because they've been playing in AAA where the pitch clock was implemented. So all those questions were questions I wanted to answer by taking the data from the pitch tempo leaderboard. Now, the original title of this talk was since the start of pitch tracking, which, which is 2008. Uh, I knew the data set relatively well, and I knew that the pitch, the each pitch had a ID on it, sometimes called SVID or pitch FX ID. And each pitch had this, but it, and I knew it was a date and a time. I thought, oh, I can use that time code as 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 this uh, way to measure between pitches. Uh, and it turns out, uh, I, investigating that ID, it really didn't correlate with pitch release, which is really what you want. You want to get to pitch release. So. It, this is the new title of the talk here. This is Trends in MLB Pitch Tempo Since 2010, because that's when, when you dive into the Stats API, you can finally see actual timestamps. You can actually see when the pitcher is releasing the ball. The data in 2008 and 2009 had uh, some indication of when the play pitch was happening. It probably had to do with the Datacaster Stringer I could never de deconstruct what that ID actually was, what that time actually was. But 2010, we got we got the data. When I started getting into this, I downloaded all the data from the Stats API and really tried to analyze more about how you know the trends were going. So first, uh, let's define this. If you don't know, this is from the uh, Savant website, and uh, thanks to Darren and the whole team. I mean, this this data set is brilliant. Um, to uh, explore, but they, they have these nice graphics, and I don't know if that's Dana's work or someone else's work, but the, the, the graphics associated with the pitch tempo leaderboard are useful, um, and they define it as the time between pitches, but not on every pitch. It's the median, when the, the, the data they show is the median of all pitches that are takes, 
and you're pitch you're pitching to the bat the same batter. So there's a lot of uh, selection of the data here. It's not every single pitch, and I'll describe how that looks different on Fangraphs in, in some other in some other slides. But the you understand this? It's the time between the pitches. So you need the timestamp, and you and till the next pitch release. So the gap between pitch to pitch is the pitch tempo. Take the full data set, get the median, and now you've got that pitcher's pitch tempo. Okay, now the way it's broken down, it's broken down correctly, I think, when the bases are empty, the pitch tempo is very different than when the bases have runners on them. So that, that's separated out by the baseball savant data, and it's useful because it's very different. And so these, uh, these graphics show you, and I'm going to point them out here, these are the median times of these of these pitchers, Wade Miley and uh, Jonathan Loisaga, in uh, 2022. And Wade Miley was very fast. And what's great about this little stopwatch icon is you can see the histogram of the pitches of all the pitches that were uh, takes. So this is there's a lot of information here. I think it's a nice graphic to help start understanding better pitch tempo. What this pitch tempo uh, metric actually is. So I, I wanted to investigate this more, and I wanted to, uh, you know, look at the leaderboard. This is the leaderboard sortable, as we see. If you've ever gone to Savant, you know how, there's lots of great information there, and it's growing every year, as we just saw. And when you sort the 2022 pitch tempo boards, you get Loisaga, get Gallegos, and Kenley Jansen, Kyle Finnegan. So again, I, I want to cover the history. I want to uh, go through the effect on teams in the last 13 years. And that's a lot of pitches. It's a lot of data associated with the teams over those years. Uh, I want to cover Kenley Jansen in particular, mainly because I could see his his uh, outing yesterday and I could get his pitches yesterday because we can address the fact whether this is an issue. And bearing the lead, all major leaguers are going to be fine with the pitch clock. Let's just, that's, that's, the, that's the message. No, there's going to be no trouble at all with this by major league pitchers. There were certainly lots of stories over the winter where it could be trouble. The big, the big story is it's not a problem and it's dramatically increasing, uh, decreasing the uh, game time, increasing the pace of play. So huge, huge success. That's the final ultimate story in, in, in all of this. So in a way, this is sort of data that's going to be archaic and not interesting because it's all changing. Now, this is the leaderboard, very useful. Now, when you look at the history, there's a lot of data here. These are, the blue line is men on base from 2010, the start of pitch stamp timing, all the way to last year, 2022. Men on base and every single data point here is about 122,000 pitches. There's a lot of data here. This is the full data set of the year, both on base and base is empty, the red line. And you can see it's graphed here, the actual pitch to pitch time. And there is a separation, it's obvious. And you could see the trends go together. In other words, the on-base trend and the men on base trend go together. Uh, I hadn't seen much reporting of this historical data set, but I found it interesting just in basically for two, maybe three reasons. You see a real change in 2016. The rule change in 2016 ha that happened was they implemented uh, the timer. The, my job at, at Fenway Park was to start a 30-second timer, and the umpire is supposed to walk out to the uh, the mound visit by uh, coaches and to stop the mound visit at 30 seconds. So they walk out with 10 seconds left to keep to keep this going. Before that implement the before the implementation of that rule. Mound visits kind of went on at the umpire's discretion, and they went on, on, and on. And that's included in this data set. Those long mound visits are in data before 2016. The umpires got better at implementing it, and you can see the decreasing trend there. That's the 30-second clock effect decreasing pitch temp, decreasing the time between pitches you know, in this data set. Now, there's another big decrease from last year. And they implemented the optional pitch com. And the optional pitch com had a bigger effect on the men on base data. And it made sense. Uh, I think uh, a, a friend from MLB who's in the back there informed me what, what, what was happening here. They analyzed the data set of men on base and they found that pitch com, and this makes sense, pitch com essentially 
dropped men on second as a problem. Now there was no extra time between pitches associated with trying to uh, trying to fool the batter with different signaling and everything else. Pitchcom greatly shrank the pitch tempo of runners on second base. So that's why the blue line has a bigger decrease here in 2022 than in than the red line, the, the slope of that line for uh, bases empty. But Pitchcom helped also slightly with bases empty. Now, Pitchcom was optional, but it was used fairly widely. Uh, we, we don't have all the data of which pitchers used it when, at least as far as I could see. And But that, that decrease in slope here is different because of the really, the really important impact of pitch comm on pitch tempo. So this is uh, some historical data. Now, Fangraphs also has been publishing these data, and they call it PACE. And PACE includes both of these other lines. It includes the men on base uh, situation and when bases are empty in their PACE, uh, in their pace variable. The nice thing about pace, this is pace of the whole league, of all, of all, uh, of all pitchers, all uh, the whole season. You can see it follows the same trend, which is good. And when I saw this and I graphed this all together, I was very happy that you know there was these these measures were uh, in sync, and, and they were they were measuring very similar things, and that was good. Fan graphs was easier to implement uh, and test and and play with. So I used a lot of other analysis on the fan graphs pace, but the men on base, bases empty look at things was also useful. Um, so this is the yearly trends, the historical trend. I found it interesting, especially in how it, it was changing, but clearly you can see these slopes going up before 2016 and from 2018 to 2021, the, the slopes going up. So something's going on in the game to increase the pitch pitched uh, the time between pitches. And a lot of people speculated. They thought it had to do with recovery of pitchers. It was strategically adding some recovery time to pitchers so they might actually have a better chance to spin the ball and locate or throw the ball faster. So this might have been a strategy by different teams. So I, that's why I wanted to drill down into teams. What were teams doing in particular? And so I grabbed the data set and I separated it out by teams. I downloaded a very cool R uh, package called MLB Logos. If you haven't used it, if you'd like to use R, it's it's wicked fun. So, um, but this data set shows you the everything. Thirteen years worth of data of pitch tempo by team. Okay, so this is lots of data. This is approximate. Well, I haven't approximated the data, but we're we're talking uh, millions of pitches here. Okay, and. Clearly, the Red Sox, Rays, Dodgers, and Yankees were pretty much separated over that full time frame from the rest of the pack. Now, what's interesting, it's not just an AL East thing. It's not just the playing other AL East teams like Yankees, Red Sox, and Rays. The Orioles were the, were the lowest uh, team. They had the shortest pitch time. So, again, there's a slight indication here that maybe – some teams were strategic in how they thought about recovery and longer pitch times between pitches. Don't know. I'm not privy to this kind of talk or discussion uh, in the front offices, but these data are very significant. They're very different. There's lots and lots of sample in here, and this is a real, real trend. Now, part of this trend might have been interesting to look at over the whole 13 years to, to get at the question of team strategy recovery. But another question would be what happened last year? Because last year, I think most people had a sense, oh, this, this pitch clock might be coming. And so this, this, this graph, very similar idea, all teams, but it's just 2022. And you can see uh, a lot of teams were different. Now we might be talking just about pitching staffs and their particular, you know, uh, strategies among those pitchers themselves. But the more significant data, I think, is this one here to talk about recovery as a strategy by, by uh, teams. So look, I found that interesting looking at teams. Uh, but then I wanted to talk about uh, Kenley Jansen. Kenley Jansen's uh, stopwatch graphic of 2022 is here, very high uh, with the top top stop watches is uh, bases empty. The lower stop watches 
is when it, uh, runners are on base. That's the highest uh, pitch uh, tempo in all the data set in 2022. Ken Lee Jansen was sort of the poster boy of somebody who had to change how he was going to pitch. And I sorted the data, data set here. Runners on base, he was 0.6 seconds higher. And th there's a, a 150 pitches in this sample, 0.6 uh, seconds higher than the next sl uh, slowest pitcher by pitch tempo. So Kenley Jansen was always discussed this winter as the person everyone had to look at to see, oh, is this going to be a new thing Kenley has to adapt to? Well, of course, he had to adapt to it. He had to, here's Kenley Jansen's historical record. What those dashed lines are, uh, this is what the, this is what Savant says is what you have to get to to get the right pitch tempo rules for this year. So Kenley, for many, many years, has been over the pitch time that uh, is required to, for these new pitch rules coming this year. And those are those are indicated by those dashed lines. So Kenley really had to adapt. And so everyone was curious what he was doing this year. Now, again, th those, uh, those lines are the uh, approximate pitch timer lines, and that's not the same graph as as what we showed, uh, not the same data set we, that Savant showed as pitch tempo. So uh, this is uh, this is Kenley uh, just yesterday, and you can see here um, this this circle here. You could, the clock is running down, and so Kenley uh, yesterday threw sixteen pitches, and seven of them were categorizable as takes you know, the called strike, called ball, which is what the pitch tempo metric is is looking at, and to the same pitcher. And his median uh, was, it was no nobody was on base, and the median time was 16, okay? So yesterday, super small sample size, 16 seconds pitch tempo, nobody on base, but I'll go back. Oh, no, it's right here, sorry. Uh, that was 25.6 seconds over a lot much larger sample size last year. He's reduced his time to between pitches by 10 seconds just by how he's approaching the game. This is going on all over baseball, okay? I've had the privilege of running the pitch clock for a few games in spring training, and it's incredible how everybody's really conforming to this pitch clock. It's really, really working. And if you haven't followed the data set uh, that uh, how the game is shifted, uh, you know, the time of game has shifted. It's really going to be changing the pace of play. It, it's a, it's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. Um, great way to watch a game too. Although um, being the pitch clock operator, you're paying attention to every pitch. I estimated with a, with a colleague that I'm probably, I probably have uh, 1100 clicks of the clock every game, 1100 clicks. In a two-hour and twenty-minute game, it's you got to pay attention. It's going to be it's going to be fun to uh, see how this plays out. Though. I'm, I, I definitely predict much shorter game time. So uh, the last thing I wanted to look at was uh, the data set associated with t service time. So what I scraped I scraped the service time data from Fangraphs. Uh, I also included it with their pace in 2022. Uh, so I only took pitchers who had some innings. I drew this line just to show the distinct difference. The, the everything to the the left here at zero MLB service time. Okay, are these are all the pitchers who have uh, that came up to the major leagues in 2022 just for a little bit. They didn't have a full year. They didn't get one year service time. They didn't, but they uh, they were rookies in the game. And you can see this, I drew that line to distinguish the rookies versus all the others. The outliers at the top are, uh, you know, Jansen, Araldus Chapman, Gallegos, Devin Williams of the Brewers. The furthest service time is Zach Brinke. The, the outlier on the bottom is Wade Miley. And that makes sense too. We know he's very fast. I had the privilege of watching Wade Miley this week and he was ready to go. He, we all know this though, if you paid attention to the Brewers and uh, watched in his career and watched how he's pitched. But, but the, the data is the, my question about whether or not the rookies were already adapted to all this and ready to go. It's clearly the case. 
So again, I, I was interested in the history. I, I put that data set together to try to follow things. The, the, the trend in those data made sense to me about the rule changes. And it's gonna be a huge change this year, obviously. Again, it was interesting to watch that there's indications potentially of recovery strategies by different teams. Interesting to consider uh, over those past 13 years of data, lots of data points. Uh, Kenley has adjusted just by a very small sample size. He did pitch yesterday and he got way under the pitch clock times, uh, had no infractions, uh, no violations of the pitch, uh, pitch clock. And uh, the rookie, I was just curious if rookies were adapted, they were. So that was my exploration of, uh, of the pitch tempo released by Savant. Thank you for your time and attention. And I, you know, Scott told me to flex my award. You know, I should put it up here, but uh, I won't do that. But um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd love to uh, address any questions you have. Uh, the rookies have one guy who's a little bit on the front side. Yeah, J.P. Sears of the A's. He's a 27-year-old rookie. I don't know why he took longer than the others. Uh, maybe he just, being older, he said, okay, I'll take my time. I don't know. I really don't know. But it's J.P. Sears. Yeah. It looks like on the top of the video, we're going to slow the pitchers, and we're all relievers. Is that a legitimate trend? And have the uh, increases in time between the system over the last 15 years correlated with the increased reliever usage over that time? That could, that's a great question. I didn't look at that, unfortunately, but I think that's a great thing to look at. Uh, the clear, Clearly, the number of innings for a, a team by the starting pitching is shrinking. So that could easily impact the increasing slopes that we've seen. Uh, in, in the whole his, historical data set, but I, I didn't check that. Running the pitch clock, what's your margin of error? Is anybody checking your time to see if you're accidentally favoring a particular? Person? Yes, there are. Uh, the the pitch the I, I I don't know how much I should say. This is a public forum, but. They, they are measuring my performance. I think I can fairly say that. They, as in MLB, is watching how well we do because there's enough video evidence and how well I'm running the pitch clock to check how I'm doing. I think that's, I think that's probably the limit of what I should say publicly because they've really clamped down on, uh, they, they don't want us to talk necessarily to the media. So I, I just want to be circumspect. If you really, really want to know, maybe we can talk around the corner somewhere. Yeah. Brian. I'm curious how guys like um, Jansen were able to successfully fit inside the pitch clock. And I'm curious whether that's the most effective performance. I think I think that's a great question. I looked at the pitches that I, I did in my sample of seven, and there were I think there were all cutters. He was throwing cutters yesterday only, which is his pitch. Uh, I didn't, they looked fine. They were like 94 mile an hour cutters. And I'm like, well, that looks pretty good to me. I didn't check it, the, the movement and the velocity versus his historical movement and velocity. You Exactly. No, this will, this will be done. I'm sure because uh, if the if the question of recovery is real, uh, and I think it is, the data might indicate that pitchers were thinking that way and teams were thinking that way. The idea of their their stuff is really going to matter, and it could change. This could change with the new pitch clock. It's it's going to be a question somebody's going to answer. Yeah. You created a database that actually let us compare. Success for pitches with various amounts of time in various amounts of time in time here. Maybe it was never any advantage in the damn first place. That's a that's another question. That's true. It data uh, like the whole pitch. You know, I I'm going to ask somebody very specifically. I mean, I, I've created my own database with this, and I just don't think I can. You know, 
share it publicly or something, but I don't know. I don't know the rules with this, but the, the, the I have two students very much involved in playing with those kinds of questions. Like what are the intricacies of pitch tempo and stuff, pitch performance, those kind of things. So, but they're doing it as research projects. You look at all the distribution of um, non zero strike swing strikes at all, and that some of them around the tempo, or do you advise that baseball savant keeps eliminating swing strikes from their tempo that they present? It's a, I'd be curious why they eliminate it. It's pretty close to a called strike. If you watch a swinging strike versus a called strike, the only difference might be that, you know, the batter has to do a slight adjustment and the catcher might have a delay in the throwback or something. There might be an impact. It's probably worth doing the comparison on pitch tempo, tempo of swinging versus called, um, and even just called balls even. But um, maybe the savant folks did that and they thought it was different enough that it was more fair to just include the takes and not the swings. And just wondering if you look at data by the batting, I'm interested if some teams take longer and the box maybe step out and need to uh, longer. That, that it's all there. Uh, I wanted to, um, and I think that could be the the Red, <laughs> the Red Sox effect. I mean, the, the thing with, this is just the pitching side, obviously, but when I I've been, since 2010, I've been privileged enough to watch lots of Red Sox games from the press box for MLB part-time jobs. And those games go on and on and on. And it is a combination of batters and pitchers, but I did I didn't look at that particularly. It would be it's easy to do. I could actually probably do that slide, get it up in about 20, 30 minutes, because Fangraphs has all that by pitcher above by batter as well. I think it would be interesting to look at the Astros narrow as well. Good question. Yeah, I like that. That's a good observation. I think uh that's something I'll do. I'll tell my students to go do it. When I get back home, any other questions? Yeah, when you saw the teams, uh, I think both the song and that pretty great distribution. Were those bars just added to drop the developers of the years, or were you looking at a season by season distribution? This, this is just 2022, this one. And this one is all 13 years. This is lots and lots and lots of data. data. Well, this is the combined whole thing for 13 years it's just the mean it's just the mean the mean difference to the average and the average of the year changes but it was yeah any other questions thank you so much for your attention and uh on to the next talk <laughs>